Hello gardeners and thank you for watching. This is Mid-American Gardener and we're here to talk about all things plants and maybe bugs. I'm looking at the panel, that's why I added bugs. So thank you for joining us. I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois on the Urbana-Champaign campus. So I'm in the uh, College of Aces, Crop Sciences Department. So if if there are any kind of printing questions, I might jump in, but we've got three really talented folks. So let's find out who's here and what their expertise is. And I'm gonna start first with you, Kent Miles. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Kent Miles and I am a uh, business is called Illinois Willows. We're a specially cut flower grower uh, located in Western uh, Champaign County. Uh, we primarily do farmer's markets, uh, wholesale grow, wholesale uh, florist, retail florist, and uh, some commercial accounts also. Uh, we got an email um, from Normal, Illinois, and it has to deal with a white, a white pine. Uh, the caller emails says, below is a picture of a dead white pine in our yard. It started browning out at the end of summer. I don't know why. Would you have any ideas? Also, if we dig it up, can we plant another tree in the same hole? Or should we just cut the tree? And how far away should we plant another um, new tree? Uh, Marilyn, I probably, uh, white pines normally can grow okay here in Illinois. They're more popular uh, and have a better uh, uh, habitat in northern uh, Midwest, uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan. Um, as normally on a white pine, they will start to uh, yellow the uh, inner needles. Uh, they'll turn kind of a pale green to a yellow. That can either happen in the springtime or in the fall, and that's normal because they will drop their inner needles while they are putting out new growth. Um, probably the tree would be, it doesn't look like it's that tall, maybe 15 to 20 foot. Um, by the picture, the, the, lar the yard looks like it's established, so it doesn't look like it's a new uh, planting of a tree uh, or a new uh, installation of a landscape because the, the turf looks like it's been there for a while. Uh, perhaps the uh, pine, uh, maybe we went through a dry period uh, starting in the spring and then it, it does take quite a long time for them to um, turn brown and then you end up with just a stick. So I would go ahead and remove it if you haven't done it already. And uh, I probably would not plant another white pine in this general same hole. Uh, would probably go 20 to 30 feet away if you wanted to go ahead and stick with another white pine or use another type of an evergreen. Uh, might work out better. Yeah, I wonder if it was something just there in that soil. You never know. Sometimes if it's, if it's a new, new lawn, a new construction, a lot of times they'll right. have too much clay and they'll just fill mm -hmm. the yard with that and then they'll throw a little bit of topsoil and, and that not won't enough. do it. No, not enough. But hopefully with another a little farther away, it mm -hmm. should work out. Well, yeah. good. Thank you very mm -hmm. much for, for that question. And now we're going to go next to Jennifer Fishburn. Good evening. I'm Jennifer Fishburn with the University of Illinois Extension. I'm a horticulture educator covering Logan, Menard, and Sagamon counties. Um, I can talk just about anything, but I, my preferences are vegetables, herbs, um, annuals, perennials. Um, this evening I brought with me a show and tell. I have Genovese basil. Um, this is a large leaf basil, um, great for cooking with, uh, has a good flavor that a lot of people like. Um, as an annual, it's one of those that uh, it will grow and then you just pick off the leaves as you need them or as it starts, if you start to see flower blossoms, you would then um, prune it back by at least a third um, and do that all throughout the summer and you'll have um, lots and lots of wonderful pesto or tomatoes and basil and mozzarella. Um, but this is one that has a really nice flavor that a lot of people like. 
you're making me want to plant it, but it's just a little bit early to plant. So, <laughs> well, and I, I, we can tell our viewers how wonderful it smells, but of course they can't smell that. But yeah, so, it smells great in here. <laughs> so you won't mention it. I won't mention okay. it. Okay. <laughs> it looks it looks good. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer. And now to you, Dr. Jim Appleby, the pest of the week. I am the pest of the week. Well, I'm an entomologist here at the University of Illinois in the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Studies. So I deal with insects and mites attacking trees, shrubs, and flowers. I'd like to talk a little bit about one of my hobbies is water gardening. I think Diane knows that. I, oh, yes. I, uh, I love water gardening. I think you folks that don't have a water garden, you have the space, you'd really enjoy this hobby. But when you have water gardens, you have a problem with mosquitoes. And this is an interesting um, fact that I found out this summer, that if you have fish in a pond, the western chorus frog, which is a very common frog here in the Midwest, as soon as the ice melts off the uh, pond, those little uh, western forest frogs come in and uh, they start singing and laying eggs. They've done that for years because for many, many years, I have two ponds, and the big pond, I put in zebra fish. They're a tropical fish. So, uh, you know, you, I take them in in the wintertime. The ones that, you, if you can't get every fish, the other ones that are in the pond, they'll die. But as a result, you know, uh, that overwintering, and there's no fish in that pond. Well, as soon as the ice goes out, those frogs come in and they start singing and they produce a large number of eggs. This past year, in the month of September, all my zebra fish died. They got some kind of a disease. So I was confronted with the problem as well. I have to have some fish in there because if I don't, I have a mosquito problem. So I bought some minnows at the local store and uh, lo and behold, they overwintered. As a result, the little western chorus frogs would not deposit their eggs or even sing near that pond. As long as you have fish, in there, and no matter how, what size, I mean, these are small fish, and still those frogs knew that, and so they did not not go into that water. I have another pond, a much smaller pond, and that had no fish, and the coarse frogs went into that. But then I was confronted with the, um, the problem with mosquitoes in that pond. So what I did, uh, went to the store, and I knew that they had this um, control called mosquito dunks. And um, they're like a little donut, some of them. There's some other manufacturers that are more like a pellet. And they're encased, uh, encased in uh, a material that dissolves in the water. And the active ingredient is Bacillus thuringiensis, and the, uh, the uh, strain is Israeliensis. And that controls mosquitoes as well as fungus gnats. So if you throw mm -hmm. one of those pellets in the water, then uh, that dissolves and, and kills the mosquitoes. And it worked out beautifully in that pond that had no uh, fish. So I got control and I had the frogs, and then eventually I put in fish. So something you might want to consider if you have a water garden and you have a problem with uh, you know, mosquitoes or any other kind of container, this material now, it really works out that well. That was actually nice diversity. Yeah, it was. It was very, and, and, and yeah. interesting, too. I have used dunks. Uh, yeah, it really works out in well. In small ponds. Yeah, and, and you know, you have to renew that about once a month. Yeah, and I and, uh, always remember I didn't do it on time, but then I get it done. So thank you very much. That was really good because I know a lot of people like water gardening. Well, let's go to the Did You Know segment next. Asparagus plants can take up to three years to produce edible stalks, but once the plants start, they can be productive for up to two decades. And I might say maybe even a little longer. So that's, uh, asparagus is really great this time of year. All right, we're gonna go to Susanna's question about azalea, and we're gonna go to line two. Hi, Susanna. Good evening, Diane. Thank you for taking my call. You're welcome. I love the azaleas. They're so beautiful. My question is, if I clipped the flower from some neighbor's bush and planted it, will it grow? So you're saying clip the end? Did she say flower or stem? 
flowers. She did oh. say flower. Okay. And um, the answer to that, short answer to that would be probably not. If you're just taking a flower, you would actually need to take a woody cutting. And um, I don't think this time of year would be the, the time to do that. The other thing you do have to watch is that some of some azaleas are trademarked or registered. Mm -hmm. And um, that means you probably don't want to do that because um, it's against their trademark and registration. So um, do know which kind it is. Um, this time of year, though, you should be able to find a one-gallon azalea plant at most garden centers, fairly inexpensive. Uh, just make sure that they're hardy to your zone. Um, for a lot of folks, that's going to be zone five. Um, and I was looking today, and Northern Light Series is a, is a really good azalea series for um, cold hardiness. And haven't the azaleas been beautiful? They almost jump out at you from people's yards and, you know, set back even. Yeah. They're just gorgeous. So Some of the combinations that people do is really... And the way they overlay, mm -hmm. you get some yeah. purples with whites and yeah. pinks. Oh, good job, gardeners. <laughs> I have not one azalea in my yard because I have not so much shade, but I really enjoy yours. Well, thank you for that question. And let's go to Ann's question. Um, and it's on line three. You have an insect question, Ann. What is that? Yes. I am being eaten up in the garden with these gnats, and they are so thick around my fish pond. They're little tiny flying insects, and I'm wondering if they're the same kind of gnats that get into your chicken's nostrils and will kill the chickens, too. Oh, I don't think so. I don't think those gnats uh, would cause any problems to your chickens. Um, you know, uh, I, I got a material here, and I think you're probably familiar with that, is uh, any of these uh, repellents that contains DEET. So what I do is when I'm out in the garden and I'm bothered by these gnats, I... Uh, I'm just going to turn it so she can read okay. it. Okay, I, uh, I go and uh, spray underneath my hat. And, you know, uh, I, I use a straw hat, and I think we gardeners ought to protect ourselves against from the sunlight because of skin cancer. So I have a great big hat. Underneath the lip of that, I spray this DEET spray around there, and that keeps the, uh, you know, the gnats away. It does a good job. So I would suggest that you try that. And it's not on you. It's, it's not on, on you. the no. bill of the hat. Right. It's on the underside of the hat. Another thing that we like to use, you can usually find them in the camping section, are the hats that actually have the net on them mm -hmm. that you can tie. Those are really meant for mosquitoes, but they work great for gnats as well because yeah. the gnats seem to migrate towards the face where you're mm -hmm. breathing. Um, so that could, it might yeah. look kind of funny, but um, you, it's helpful. And my son gave me just the netting, and I use it with a ball cap. Mm -hmm. So it just kind of... Don't put it too tight <laughs> at your throat, but, but yeah, the gnats have been out a little bit more this year. So thank you for that question. Gardeners have to do what we have to do, no matter through thick and thin. Well, let's go to Joe's question about roses, and he's on line four. Hi, Joe. Good afternoon. Uh, Hi. My knockout roses look like they have wilt on them this year, and I have actually used a fungicide on them about a week and a half ago, and I still aren't full that happy okay do they um so they look wilted and it, do you, i was just wondering if it was from cold damage but but if this is actually wilt i'll hand it off to someone else but any ideas anyone knockout roses are pretty resilient i haven't seen um, wilt on them but i've seen cold damage this year yeah there's been a lot of cold damage but they would have come out of that by now i would think unless you're in an area where you're were frosted recently, which I don't think we've had any of that. Um, if it's the whole plant, be really careful if you go to prune it. Don't use and make sure you clean your pruners between that and another um, plant. But I don't know what that would be. Yeah, I'm not really sure. At this I just, time of year, knockout roses just are so tough. And, and I hate to say it, unless there's been some herbicide sprayed or when you're in your mm -hmm. area generally though you you see that on one side of the plant or the other not the whole entire plant unless it was in your yard if there was any herbicides used um, nearby and the wind was blowing possibly um, that could cause wilt okay well there gives you something to think about let's go to uh, bill's question on line five about bees hi bill oh hi what's your question well every spring my picnic table gets uh, drilled into by what I think are carpenter bees, and uh, I don't mind them. They're nice. They they don't uh, bite, or but but 
when you have 20 or 30 of them hovering around, it kind of makes you nervous. My, but I got curious about the fact that I never see them land. I see them hover constantly for minutes at a time in one position, and then all of a sudden they'll shoot 20 or 30 feet at high speed to another position and stop and turn around and zip another way. And uh, I'm curious about how, where do they get all their energy? I never see them <laughs> feed on anything. Do you have any ideas on that? Well, I, they, you know, they feed on pollen and nectar, uh, so uh, they will do that. Um, if you're having problems with uh, carpenter bees getting into the wood, you really need to paint that wood or stain it. That, great, uh, that greatly helps to keep them away, and you need to do that before the bees uh, occur, you know, before they come out. So uh, uh, that's what I would do. I would paint it. People that are, have not painted the surface for several years, then you get carpenter bees working in the wood. But and a it, picnic table, that seems unusual, doesn't it? A and little unusual. Most hmm. of it's on the wood siding of the house. So maybe it's better it's a picnic table <laughs> <laughs> in that case. So yeah, they are high energy. They are high they energy. Are, unfortunately. A lot of buzzing. Okay, well thank you for that. And Marissa has a question on line six about something about mosquitoes. Hi Marissa. Line six? Am I on line six? Yes, you are. Are you Marissa? No, I'm not. I'm Loretta. <laughs> well, I didn't I say it right. Okay. <laughs> what is your question? I want you to know about that mosquito repellent that you put into the pond. I missed the name of it somehow. Well, it's sold under a couple different trade names. Uh, one is Mosquito Dunks, just like you dunk a donut. Uh, mosquito Dunk. But uh, if you go to any of the garden stores and ask for uh, the uh, material that you put in your pond, and that will be containing Bacillus thuringiensis israeliensis. And so uh, just ask for that material. And like I said, they come in, uh, in like little donuts, and uh, the, uh, the, you just throw them in the pond, and then that encased in, encased in the or on the outside will dissolve and then it will the granules will fall into the water and control the mosquito larvae. So the dunk is kind of a generic. It's a, yeah, a generic. The uh, little donut. And it is a trade name mosquito dunks but some other them are just called mosquito I don't know what away or something like yeah. that. Yeah so just ask for those and you'll find them in almost you know any place that has anything to do with ponds. Yep. Okay, well we're gonna go to back to our panelists and I'm really fascinated, Kent, by what is next to you at the table. You've gotta talk about those. Okay, uh, brought in a couple of our flowering branches that we're harvesting at the present time. Uh, <clears throat> this first one is one of our lilacs. Wow. It's a double white really uh, blossom. Has just a heavenly, wonderful scent to it. Uh, what we do when we harvest them and the homeowner can do this if they have lilac bushes in their house is to remove almost all of the foliage um, because when you place this in a vase of water when you bring them in at home um, a lot of the it, the leaves are just competing with the flowers so if you remove the foliage you'll get all the water going up into the uh, flower head and you'll get a lot longer uh, vase life mm. um, we do the purples, the whites. Uh, we do a couple of the um, bicolored uh, lilacs. Mm. Uh, so this is one that we've been doing uh, for about three weeks now. Is that a special name for that? Uh, the variety it is, uh, it escapes me at the moment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, the interesting thing too, Kent mm -hmm. has these cut, but but he has them in solution. Yeah. Be sure to show yeah. that. What we did, uh, just so they wouldn't wilt on the way here, uh, we went ahead and put them in a water tube, which is a plastic tube with a rubber cap, and that holds the moisture in the water so that the um, flowers aren't going to wilt in transportation. It's such a beautiful full bloom. Yes, yes. it is. It's gorgeous. It's so beautiful. This other um, sample that we're doing here is the viburnum. It's the snowball viburnum, and this is more of a mature color that we would uh, harvest. We normally cut these when the uh, florets and the, the blossom head are more of a bright green, like the foliage. Uh, we sell it in the green stage. Uh, right now it's kind of in the limey, pale green. Uh, it's starting to color up into a white. Uh, another couple of weeks, this will be uh, 
larger, more of a baseball size. It'll be pure white, and that's why it gets its name Snowball. Um, but there's it's so of, many it's on one of our stem. It's one of our viburnums um, oh, that we will have at the farmer's markets or we uh, wholesale and then florist buy it. Did you say farmer's market, Yes, Kent? it's that time of year again. <laughs> farmer's market season. Uh, the Champagne Market is on Tuesdays and the downtown Champagne and the Urbana Market is at Lincoln Square parking lot where it's always been. And those have uh, both started this week. They run all the way up through the end of Ur October. Urbana on Saturday That's and right. Champagne on Tuesday. Tuesdays, yes. From here on out. So yes. think about that. Whatever area, and I know a lot of you have, uh, in other areas, have really great farmer's markets as well. Let those folks Support those folks is what I'm trying to say. Okay, well, let's see what have you got for us, Jennifer. Um, I have a question from a viewer. Um, he lives in Manhattan, Illinois. He has a 25-year-old forsythia bush in which it is, um, he says, really never bloomed. It's a metal lark, and he's noticed that everyone around him has blooming, um, had had blooming plants at the time. He did transplant some to another property and those bloomed. So there's the key to your um, answer to your question. He wants to know what tips he ha we have on um, getting those to bloom. Well, if they're 25 years old and you've never um, pruned them, um, a little overdue. Uh, but pruning uh, for Scythia really has a huge advantage in that they will flush out new growth and have really beautiful blooms. So you have two options. One is to cut them all the way back to the ground and um, remove everything. Uh, usually done more in a dormant type season or and the other option would be to remove a third of the oldest, um, what we call usually canes or stems um, and remove those and then do that every year, 30 each year. If you do the cutting back all the way, you'll do that every three to five years and that will flush out your new growth. But, um, and that's for Forsythia. There are other shrubs that you can do this with, but don't do that with all your shrubs because some shrubs will not tolerate hard prunes, but the Forsythia will. Okay, very good, thank you. And now, Jim. Well, a lot of people are having problems with rabbits feeding on their ornamental plants, particularly the uh, succulent plants that the rabbits like. And uh, there's a lot of different products. This product here is made by Have a Heart. It's called Critter Ritter. And it's a um, hot pepper sauce base. And uh, the only disadvantage of this, I really don't like this brand because the sprayer does not work, it clogs up immediately. Hmm. So I have to take this out, I put it in, the, in another container and then I take a brush and just brush here and there on the, on the plants and I guess the rabbits take a bite of that, they will not go back to that plant again. Then the other product, hmm. what my sister uses back in Ohio, she really likes this, it's called deer and rabbit repellent. and. Um, uh, this is repellent, so it's, it's not something that they taste, but uh, this works out real well. It keeps the deer as well as squirrels and rabbits away, so different products that you have. Very good. It's nice to know some variety and maybe switch them out yeah. too, yeah. different ones. Okay, we're going to go back to the phone lines and Margaret's question on line two about gardening. Hi, Margaret. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> and what's your question? Well, I wanted to comment about the water garden. I've had a water garden for over 20 years. Yes. And uh, I have experimented with fish. I have goldfish. I've just let them be there, and they overwinter very nicely. The pot, one part of the pond is four feet deep, but uh, I have a mm -hmm. biologic filter. I don't have any mosquitoes. I can sit out there in the patio. The goldfish eat the mosquito larva, and I watch them mm -hmm. do it. So I know that that's fit, and, and they also eat well some of, some of the plant material, and it's it's a nice balance. Yes, it is. So. I totally agree with you on that. Uh, the problem is that I like frogs, and I like them in my pond. And if you have <laughs> goldfish or any kind of fish in your pond, the frogs will not come and uh, deposit their eggs or sing in your pond. So if you have two, like you do, yeah, but then she has the fish eating her mosquito larva. So. Right. I, I think for the average decide. person, probably the goldfish is just ideal. Yeah, so you make your priorities you and do. figure out which one it is you that you want, one or the other. Yep. Well, we're going to see if Jim has a quick question for us on line three. Hi, Jim. Hello. Do you have a good question for us? Well, um, I live in the Pawnee area, and uh, a lot of us around here have got 
asparagus patches that are 5 to 10, 20 years old, mm-hmm. and they're not producing this year. We're getting uh, spindly, tough stalks, and we're wondering what's going on. Uh, well, I know that... In the last that... three or four years, we've had, you know, size, stalks the size of your index okay. finger. Okay. We're close to the time, but I do know that we had some wet, wet weather in the... It's been, the soil's been cool yeah. and wet, so um, that's been a little bit of it. But the other part is, is if you're not adding fertilizer every year, they are heavy feeders and they need a good, rich soil in order to keep growing and doing well every year. You should have really thick stalks about the size of your thumb. Add horse manure, um, not at this time when you're harvesting, but do add some aged horse manure to that and um, do that every year and that should, should help correct it a little bit. Should we say every year? Every January, yeah. every February, every year. Let's say it together. Every, every year. year. <laughs> it really is important. I can't ext- <laughs> say it enough. Thank you all for being such good viewers and asking good questions. We thank you for watching, and we hope that you'll have a great week gardening. Goodbye.